I'm the KNDJ at WVX, the only radio station in Millfield. It's a small town, the kind where everyone knows your name and your business. My job was pretty ordinary, playing music for late night listeners until those calls started. It was around midnight on a Tuesday when I first heard that crackling voice. The line was full of static, like the caller was far away or maybe not even on this planet. Play Moonlight Serenade, the voice said, slow and deep. I didn't think much of it. Just another old time music fan, I guessed. But then it happened again the next night. And the next, always around midnight. Always that same static filled voice requesting some old, almost forgotten song. I started to feel a chill down my spine whenever the phone rang at that hour. I mentioned it to a few friends, and that's when I heard about the disappearances. Apparently, Millfield had its share of people vanishing without a trace, going back decades. It was one of those things people didn't talk about much. It was too unsettling, especially in a town like ours. Curiosity got the better of me, and I started digging into the old records at the local library. What I found was more than unsettling. It was downright horrifying. Each song requested by my midnight caller had been a favorite of someone who changed, and they were requesting Stardust. The voice crackled, sending shivers down my spine, but this time they added something new. Do you like the song, Anna? My blood ran cold. They knew my name. This wasn't some random prank or a coincidence. This was personal. I hung up, my hands shaking. I wanted to quit, to walk away from WVX and never look back, but I couldn't. I needed answers. The next day, I went to the town archives, determined to learn everything I could about the disappearances. Hours of poring over old newspapers and police reports painted a grim picture. People of all ages vanishing without a trace. No pattern, no reason. And now their favorite songs were being used to torment me. I was about to leave when an old article caught my eye. It was a story about a local musician who vanished 50 years ago. His name was Tom. He had been a regular performer at Millfield Bars, known for his love of obscure old songs, the kind my caller always requested. A crazy idea formed in my head. What if Tom was the caller? But that was impossible. He'd be ancient by now, if he was even still alive. Still, I couldn't shake the thought. That night, the call came right on schedule. Play dream a little dream of me, the voice said. I took a deep breath and asked, is this Tom? My voice, to change. The voice on the phone barely above a whisper. There was a pause, a crackling silence that felt like an eternity. And then, yes, I didn't know whether to scream or cry. The voice continued telling me a tale that was hard to believe yet impossible to dismiss. Tom had been in love, he said, with a woman who disappeared, heartbroken. He'd made a pact with something he didn't understand, something dark and ancient, in exchange for a chance to see his love again. Tom had been cursed to exist in a sort of limbo, neither alive nor dead, his only connection to the world he'd lost through these songs, the favorites of those who, like his love, had vanished. Why are you calling me? I asked, my voice trembling. You're the key, Sarah, Tom's voice crackled. You can set me free. Play the songs and let me reach her. I was terrified, but also moved by Tom's tragic story. I agreed to help not fully understanding what I was getting into. Night after night, I played the requested songs. And each night, Tom's voice grew clearer, 
more human. He started to remember more about his life, his love, his music. It was like I was bringing him back to life, one song at a time. Then came the night of the last song. Play my foolish heart, Tom said, his voice almost normal now. And thank you, Anna. I played the song, my heart pounding as the last notes faded. I waited for Tom to speak, but there was only silence. He was gone. I thought it was over, but I was wrong. The next day, a woman walked into the station. She was old, her hair white as snow, but her eyes were bright and sharp. She introduced herself as Tom's lover, the one he'd lost all those years ago. She told me she'd heard the songs, each one a piece of her own past calling to her. And on the last night, she heard Tom's voice whispering her name in the music. It had brought her back to Millfield back to the place where their love had been cut short. We talked for hours about Tom, the music, the mysteries of Millfield, and when she left, I felt a sense of closure for both of us. Story number two, here it is. I'm Han, just your average guy. I never believed much in the supernatural. That was until I started working the night shift at a remote gas station. It's a lonely job, just me and the hum of the refrigerators. The kind of place where you start talking to yourself just to break the silence. You know, I always thought those horror stories about working the graveyard shift were just that stories. Boy, was I wrong. The first few weeks were uneventful, just the occasional trucker or lost traveler. But then things started to change began to realize that something was seriously wrong. It started with small, seemingly harmless occurrences. Candy bars mysteriously ending up on the floor, objects moving on their own, and whispers that I could barely make out when the station was empty. These soft, unintelligible whispers seemed to emanate from the aisles. I tried to rationalize it as fatigue or drafts of wind, but deep down, I knew something eerie was happening. Then came the inexplicable cold spots. One moment, the air would be warm, and the next, it felt like I had stepped into a freezer. It was far from normal, and it sent shivers down my spine. I kept telling myself it was all in my head, that I was just being paranoid. But that night, that fateful night, everything changed. It was well past midnight, and the silence was palpable. Even the crickets seemed to be sleeping. A car pulled up, nothing out of the ordinary, but an inexplicable chill ran down my spine as the driver, a regular-looking guy of Asian descent like me, stepped out. He wandered through the aisles, picking up snacks as if everything was perfectly normal. However, when he reached the counter, his face twisted into something utterly horrific, a mask of pain and anger, contorted beyond recognition. It scared the living daylights out of me. Without warning, he reached over the counter and grabbed me. His hands were ice cold, unnaturally so, and his grip was like iron. I fought desperately and managed to break free, bolting into the back room. I locked the door and huddled there, heart pounding, trying to make sense of the terrifying encounter. I must have stayed in that back room for hours, too frightened to move. When dawn finally broke, I gathered my courage and ventured out. The station was empty and there was no sign of the man. I checked the security footage, my hands trembling, but the tape showed nothing. The man never appeared on it. It was as if he had never been there. I tried to convince myself that it had all been a bad dream, but the memory was too vivid, too real. I couldn't deny that something malevolent lurked in the shadows, 
and it was beyond my comprehension. Like I was giving them a voice, a chance to be heard. And it seemed to ease the restless spirits. I didn't know what to do at first. I couldn't quit my job. I needed the money. But every night, the fear was there. The whispers grew louder and more insistent. Objects moved more frequently. And the cold spots seemed to follow me around the store. I started researching, desperately searching for answers. I found stories of spirits and entities, but nothing quite fit. The more I read, the more lost I felt. I was dealing with something unknown, something that didn't adhere to the rules of ghost stories or horror movies. Nights turned into weeks. I was exhausted, always looking over my shoulder, jumping at shadows. My friends said I looked like a mess, but how could I explain? They wouldn't believe me. Who would? Then came another encounter another late-night visitor, with a different face, but the same twisted expression. This time, I was ready. I grabbed my phone to record, to prove I wasn't losing my mind. But just like before, when I looked at the footage, there was nothing, just me, seemingly talking to thin air. I was at my wit's end. I considered seeing a psychiatrist, but deep down, I knew this wasn't in my head. It was real, too real. One night, I decided to confront it. I stayed in the store, waiting. The whispers grew louder, the temperature dropped, and then came absolute silence. I felt a presence, something watching me. I spoke into the darkness, demanding answers. At first, there was nothing just an eerie stillness, then a voice, not the whispers, but a clear, distinct voice. It told me about the land, its history, and the pain and suffering that had occurred right where the gas station now stood. It spoke of unresolved anguish, of spirits tied to the place, unable to move on. I listened, my heart racing as the voice recounted tragedies long forgotten, buried in the haste to develop and modernize. It wasn't malevolent. It was sad, desperate even. It wanted to be heard, to be acknowledged. I did the only thing I could think of. I promised to remember, to tell the stories. And as I did, the temperature began to rise. The whispers faded and a sense of peace settled over the store. The next day, I started researching the history of the land. I talked to local historians, dug through old records, and learned about battles and people who had lived and died here, their stories lost to time. I kept my promise. I set up a small memorial in the gas station, telling the stories of the land and the people who had once called it home. It felt like I was giving them a voice, a chance to be heard, and it seemed to ease the restless spirits, checked his vital signs, but Marcus was insistent, his eyes never leaving that empty corner. He's here, watching us, he repeated. I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine, but I had a job to do, patience to care for, I continued my rounds, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about room seven. Later in the night, as the ER grew quieter, I decided to check on Marcus again. His muttering had grown louder, more frantic. I entered the room, and he was no longer alone. In that shadowy corner, I saw it. A vague, indistinct figure, like a silhouette, standing there. My rationality screamed at me to dismiss it as a trick of the light or a product of an exhausted mind. But I couldn't ignore the overwhelming sense of dread that washed over me. Marcus was in distress and I had to do something. 
I approached the shadowy figure, my heart racing. And as I got closer, I felt a chill in the air, an icy breeze that seemed to come from nowhere. What do you want? I demanded, my voice trembling. The figure didn't answer, but I could hear faint whispers, like secrets carried on the wind. I couldn't make out the words, but the feeling of unease grew stronger. I reached out to touch it, and my hand passed through the shadow, sending shivers down my spine. Marcus's condition was deteriorating rapidly, and I knew I had to get him out of that room. With the help of another nurse, we moved him to a different ward. As we wheeled him away, I glanced back at room seven, and the shadowy figure seemed to recede into the corner, disappearing as if it had never been there. Marcus eventually recovered, but he was haunted by the memory of that night. He spoke of the shadow man, of the secrets it whispered to him. I couldn't explain what had happened in room seven that night, and part of me didn't want to. As a rational person, I had always believed in science and medicine, but that eerie encounter had shaken my beliefs to the core. Some things, it seemed, couldn't be explained by logic or reason, and room seven had become a place of mystery and dread in the hospital lore. And there you have it, story number three. Information buried in old hospital records. A piece of the past that had long been overlooked. It was a story from decades ago. A tale of a doctor who had once worked in room seven, conducting experiments in an attempt to bridge the gap between life and death. The experiments had gone terribly wrong resulting in the doctor's own descent into madness and the creation of a malevolent entity that haunted the room. The entity, the one with the glowing red eyes, had been a result of the doctor's obsession with unlocking the secrets of life and death. It sought freedom from its eternal torment and it was willing to replace itself with another soul, a cruel, and desperate bargain. I knew what I had to do, though it terrified me. I returned to room seven, the air heavy with foreboding. I'll do it, I said aloud, knowing the entity could hear me. I'll replace you, but you have to promise to release Marcus and the others from their comas. A chilling silence hung in the room, and then the guttural voice echoed once more. Agreed. I felt a coldness envelop me, and a sensation of being pulled, stretched, and twisted. I could see the room from a new perspective, but I couldn't touch it. I was a shadowy figure with glowing red eyes, trapped within the confines of room seven. My consciousness was still intact, but I was no longer human. The entity, now free, swirled around the room before vanishing into the darkness. It had kept its promise, but at a great cost. I watched as Marcus and the others slowly emerged from their comas, their eyes filled with confusion and fear. I couldn't comfort them, couldn't explain what had happened. My existence as a shadow in room seven continued and I whispered secrets to those who occupied the room. I had become a part of the hospital's dark history, a tale of a curse that would live on long after my human life had ended. And so I remained in room seven, a prisoner of my own making, a cautionary tale of the consequences of tampering with forces beyond human understanding. The hospital would eventually close room seven for good, the stories would persist, a reminder that some mysteries should remain unsolved, and some curses could never be broken. That concludes story number three, as the shadowy presence vanished, leaving room seven finally empty 
and free from its malevolent grip, the air in the room felt lighter, and the oppressive darkness lifted, replaced by a sense of calm. I knew that the entity had found the closure it had long sought, and I hoped that it had moved on to a better place. The room was no longer haunted, and I could finally breathe a sigh of relief. The next day, I checked on Marcus and the other patients who had fallen into comas. To my amazement, they were awake, their eyes clear and lucid. They had no memory of the dark presence that had plagued them, and I decided not to burden them with the details. Room 7 was no longer infamous among the hospital staff. It became just another ordinary room, a place where patients received the care they needed without fear or superstition. As for me, I had faced the unknown and emerged changed. I had confronted a supernatural entity, made a bargain to set it free, and found a way to give it closure. It was a chapter in my life I would never forget. A reminder that sometimes the most irrational and unbelievable things could happen even to those who considered themselves rational. I continued my work as an ER nurse, knowing that there were mysteries in the world that I might never fully understand. But I had learned that compassion, empathy, and a willingness to confront the unknown could make a difference in the lives of others. And so I carried on, ready to face whatever challenges the unpredictable world of the ER might bring. Armed with the knowledge that sometimes the most unexpected solutions could come from the most unexpected places. That concludes story number three. If you have any more stories or questions, feel free to share them. I hope you've enjoyed these stories, each filled with its own unique blend of mystery, the supernatural, and human resilience. Whether it's a DJ's encounter with a spectral caller, a gas station attendant facing unexplainable phenomena, or an ER nurse's confrontation with a malevolent entity, these tales remind us that the world can be a place of wonder and uncharted territories. Remember, the mysteries of life are not always meant to be solved, and the unexplained can be as captivating as it is unsettling. As we journey through the realms of imagination and uncertainty, let's embrace the unknown with curiosity and courage. For it is in these uncharted territories that the most profound stories often find their beginnings. If you have any more stories, questions, or if there's anything else I can assist you with, please feel free to ask. 